Yeah, so while this is coming up, I'm going to give uh, perhaps a bit more of a practical um, assembly talk. Um, the term pan-genome is uh, very fashionable. You'll hear it a lot um, at this conference, and rightly so, because once you have one reference genome, that's awesome, um, but if you have a lot of diversity in the species that you're working with, you can learn much more um, once you start to add more members to that collection. And also, if those reference genomes that you're making a pan-genome for um, are platinum grade, then you're really providing actionable sequence data to your researchers. Some of the models I toss around all the time is that uh, incomplete lists, incompleteness, and low accuracy is not high throughput. So we really strive to push the limits there. So Corteva is basically a seed company coming from Pioneer Seed and uh, Dow Crop Protection. Um, if you talk to the breeders, they'll say that we sell bags of recombination, um, where someone like myself will say we sell bags of DNA sequence. Um, some of my colleagues gave talks about how we're trying to make improvements to corn and other things through genome editing. Um, and of course, to make an edit, you need to know the sequence that you need to edit. Um, you know, in the past, we would do all sorts of things, amplicon sequencing, um, back sequencing to get the sequence, um, and that works very well. Um, but again, you're getting an incomplete story there. Um, if you did amplicon sequencing, you wouldn't be able to calculate off-target cutting and that sort of thing. So there's tremendous gains of efficiency that can come from doing a whole genome. And we find that even if we're going after a single gene for a QTL, doing the whole genome is the simplest, fastest, easiest way um, to ultimately get that sequence, put it into our bioinformatics systems, add it to our pan-genome collection, and again, make that, that information actionable. So really, we're trying to build up this uh, compendium of genomic resources for a bunch of crops. Um, all the smaller crops really want to get onto the maize bandwagon um, to leverage all the capabilities we have there. So we've known for quite a while that maize is incredibly diverse. Um, we initially figured this out from back sequencing, um, and we saw that any, any given locust can have 50 percent shared DNA, um, and the gene content can vary quite a bit. Um, in the modern era, using bio-nanomaps, this is how this whole non-shared, shared, shared uh, view plays out where you can see shared labels versus non-shared labels. Um, so here's a cartoon showing what a pan-genome looks like where you have core genes and semi-shared genes and unique genes. And I'm just showing this so you can keep in mind I have some real data later that resembles this um, quite nicely. But if you're going to set off on a pan-genome initiative, you have to have, um, it's very important that all of your genomes are, are the same quality. Um, you can't have contigs for one and scaffolds for the other. You really want to have um, pseudomolecules for each. Um, if you're going to have, you know, 30 members in your collection, you obviously need a process that's high throughput um, and robust. But the, the problem is, um, as Justin was describing earlier, um, it's really a challenge to change with the times. If the chemistry is changing um, and everything's changing around you, you, you constantly have to recalibrate. Um, and our assembly's definitely improved uh, throughout this process, and you sort of have to keep up with it. Um, as I mentioned, there's tremendous value um, in going to chromosome scale, and here's some more of my mottos that you could feel free to share with your collaborators, but it's very important because um, everyone's interested in detecting structural variation, right? But any misassembly is going to be construed as SV, um, and any sequence error is going to be construed as sequence diversity. So it's very important to move past that. Um, and for our genome editing pipelines and things like that, we, we cannot tolerate any um, errors, we don't want any surprises later, and we always want the promoter, we always want the intron. Maze genes can span 50 KB, so we really need to have a lot of um, robust sequence information. And here's what I think is really a lost art. I haven't heard any talks dedicated to manual curation um, and finishing like I did when I came here 10 years ago, um, but this is not something that should be lost. The scaffolding is not the last step in the process. There's still some things that you need to do to sort of elevate your scaffolds. Um, to be platinum grade. Um, and, you know, I, I did manual curation on a genome for two years at one point. I'm not advocating for that. But um, just a couple days or even a couple hours of manual curation um, makes it so that your misassembly is not, you know, categorized as SV. So we have a very similar recipe that's, that's being described by others. Um, this works very well. Um, at some point in the process, high c is definitely needed for new genomes or for genomes that don't behave very well. Um, 
In a slide or two, I'm going to talk about how we think we finally can drop the chromium from this equation because the packed biosequencing is becoming so accurate. Um, we see tremendous gains from having all of these um, technologies in-house. Um, that's a tremendous benefit for us. So let me just go through the, the general process and the timelines. Um, what's great, um, using in-house resources, we could do these assemblies in just a few days. One thing you need to consider when you're thinking about your sequencing technology, um, you don't want to pick that just based on the size of the instrument or even how much it costs um, because the time that it takes to assemble that or how many times you need to polish that and how long all that takes um, is definitely a consideration because um, although we want to do a really good job on these genomes, we can't spend a lot of time on them because the sequencers are, are keep running. Um, and again, we, we think we could move past the, the chromium part. Then the next step is to create scaffolds. BioNano works extremely well for that. Um, and by adding a couple layers, um, uh, additional manual curation work at this point can really uh, help your assemblies. And then again, just some extra steps to go from, uh, from scaffolds to chromosomes are necessary. So when you put all this together, we can make a reference genome that's, that's as good as anything that's ever been made in about seven days. And all the data um, can be generated in about a week or two concurrently as well. So um, this is what I call a standard curve for, for maze assembly. What's um, interesting is, you know, when you sequence a genome for the first time and you get a 10 megabase contig N50, you really have no idea if that's good or bad. Um, maybe if you heard that someone else did better, then you would know. But it's very informative to um, have several data points on this plot so that you can start to have a reasonable expectation of what contig size um, you'll get given a certain read length. And I always plot this using corrected reads because that's really what you assemble. You don't assemble raw data. Um, so ideally, you could use a sort of curve when you see, you know, 10 KB reads coming off the machine, you would tell the lab to stop. You know, I don't, I don't want 10 KB reads. That just won't work. I mean, in reality, they say we don't have any more tissue or seed. We're, we're going for it anyway. But um, so one of the reasons I'm not really super enamored with read length is you could see here that um, with just 30 KB reads, um, you know, we can have an assembly that has a 43 megabase contig in 50. And some of the species we work with have contig or chromosomes that are, that are this length. So at some point, there's going to be diminishing returns in terms of read length. And I'm very happy to get 30, 40, 50 KB reads from the lab. Um, so again, once you have sort of the standard curve, then you can sort of set expectations so, and do some troubleshooting. So the very first maze um, assembly that we did using the new chemistry sort of was off that diagonal. So I was a bit concerned at this point. Um, so then we went and did the same sample um, with V5 and V6 chemistry to sort of see what was going on here. I'm going to talk about that on the next slide. So here's a garden plot, so to speak, that I have for some other crops. Um, again, you don't get much information, useful information, from having so few data points other than to say the sorghum assembles really well. Um, the one megabase contig club is really a low threshold these days. I'd cry if I would get that. Um, but as I was saying, uh, if you look at the same library, so now based on the read length that I'm getting for this soy sample, I do have some expectation of what the contig N50 should be. So digging around into this, the first thing you notice is that the new chemistry, the reads are extremely accurate, the corrected reads. Um, the corrected reads that you get using CANU um, are CCS, 99.9% .9 accuracy. Um, and that's just causing some problems with the internal parameterizations that CANU is using. So as far as I've taken this so far, I've determined that the V6 chemistry in blue there um, using CANU has this weird bimodal distribution of accuracy. There's a bunch of reads that are like 100% accurate and then some that are 99% accurate. So ultimately, this is definitely a tractable problem that I will get back to when I get return home. Um, but yes, the new chemistry is very accurate um, for sure. So we've been using chromium in this process for polishing our assemblies, and this works much better than standard Illumina data. With your standard Illumina data, paired end reads, you'll um, be changing bases and repeats that PacBio had resolved very well. Um, so chromium works much better for this because these read clouds have much higher mappability. So we've been using chromium, um, but if you really take a close look at it, the, for the inbred species that we're working with, Chromium da data never corrects SNPs. If you see SNPs being corrected, that means there's a sample mix-up. 
Um, it's really the vast majority, 99% of the bases that are being corrected are strings of homopolymers um, being adjusted. So one way to sort of evaluate accuracy is to say, okay, if we add chromium, how much is it changing? Can we live without it? Um, with the V5 chemistry, there is a, a base and a homopolymer being changed every 7 kb in soy, 10 kb in canola, and now that's much higher. I haven't computed it for maize, but um, I think we're definitely at the point where we could drop chromium from the equation because it's really doing very little, um, and what it is doing is, is homopolymers. So um, my colleague Victor is going to talk at the BioNano workshop more about how we're applying BioNano to this whole process. The key point here is with the new chemistry, um, we're getting very few uh, BioNano maps per chromosome, typically one to three scaffolds per chromosome. So this makes scaffolding and making pseudomolecules very easy with, with so few maps. So many of you are probably familiar with BioNano and all the benefits. I mean, this is like the best thing to happen to me as, as an assembly finisher. Um, in terms of finding misassemblies, ordering and orienting contigs, but that's just part of it. There's lots of technologies that'll link um, contigs together. We never use the chromium data for scaffolding or anything like that because it's only the bio-nano maps that'll tell you the gap size between contigs. Um, and even if we only had one contig per chromosome, I would still want the bio-nano map because you get to uh, genome characterization um, you could find the collapses in your assembly and other sort of genomic properties that you can't see in your assembly. Um, there's all sorts of um, uh, weird things that could happen in your assembly that BioNano will reveal to you. So now this is, this is quite a remarkable thing. You know, we take our compact biocontig assemblies and hybrid scaffold them, um, and, and our contigs get put together like ducks in a row along the, the chromosomes. And this wasn't the case a year or two ago. I'm sort of trivializing all of this, but it's been a long time coming in that regard. Um, another thing you don't get if you're linking your contigs together with, with another technology, um, again, you don't get the gap sizing. So here's a case where we sequence this whole genome to get the sequence of one disease resistance gene at a QTL. You know, we had 30 megabase size contigs on either side of it, but the region that we wanted <laughs> had these gaps in it. And from the bio map, you can see that there's this duplication. If you look at the assembly, there is a pileup of reads um, at one of them, and we didn't get the other. So having the bio map really allows manual curation of this locus, because um, you're getting all this information um, in addition to just knowing that they're together. So this is what a lot of our, our assemblies look like. You know, very big contigs, uh, the chromosome arms, and then everything sort of gets messed up at the centromere. Um, but again, you have the sort of this blueprint of the genome, and you, you, it is feasible to go in and do manual curation here. Um, but the one thing that I'm going to throw at everybody is why are we still using Busco, Busco scores? <laughs> Every talk had it, and everybody says, I do it because everybody wants it. Everybody expects it. Um, so we have much better ways of doing this. Um, I think visually is the best. I mean, you look at this, you know exactly how good this assembly is. Short of that, um, metrics like scaffolds per chromosome, uh, percent gaps, um, the number of gaps, that sort of thing would be useful metrics for sure. Um, so another neat thing about BioNano is a sort of, um, uh, is a contiguity equalizer, like I say. Uh, as well as we're doing from the lab's point of view, Every once in a while, we do have a dud, like Pioneer Maze 23. It only had 15 KB reads, almost 3,000 contigs. Here's the thing with, with stats, right? So they, both of these assemblies have the same scaffold N50, um, but the contig 50 definitely shows you how one is, is definitely better than the other. Um, and then here's what I was sort of getting at. Um, obviously, the one on the top has less gaps. Um, so you could sort of, we could start to sort of build metrics around this. Um, but even though we're looking at the gaps, that doesn't mean that's not in your assembly. So you could have something, you could have a gap, but you probably have that piece in chromosome zero. So we need to separate metrics for scaffolds versus the whole assembly. One interesting thing I want to talk about here that's not um, widely talked about is the fact that many packed bio contigs in your assembly overlap. So here I mentioned that one um, has eight overlapping contigs, one has 54 overlapping contigs. This is something you have to deal with. Um, so the BioNano software is very good at finding conflicts and misassemblies. Um, it'll tell you that your packed biocontigs overlap, but it won't do anything about it. 
Um, and this is sort of tricky because you can't fill these gaps, so to speak. What the BioNano software will do um, is not cut either one of them. It'll stick um, 13 ends by convention there. But essentially what you've done is create an artificial uh, duplication of 8 KB and 42 KB. And then someone's going to say that that's structural variation down the line. So um, it's definitely worthwhile in what I have done. Um, again, the bigger the contigs, the less you have to do with this. But, and it is sort of an artisan thing um, about how you make these cuts so that the three contigs here end up being flush. Um, I had a whole presentation dedicated to this at the Bio Nano User's Guide because you see all kinds of scenarios um, with overlapping contigs and you really have to be surgical about how you uh, make those cuts, but it definitely has to be done. So um, uh, unlike in previous iterations of the Bio Nano software and chemistries where you would have sort of tiling between your um, scaffolds and pack bio contigs, we don't really have that anymore. Pretty much the scaffolds are set by by the chromosome scale maps that we have. So, for example, for sorghum, we have one or two scaffolds because we have one or two maps that are that big. Um, so it's really the bio-nano maps that are setting the scaffolds. But what's really nice is with one, two, three scaffolds um, per chromosome, for a well-behaved genome, you really don't need the high c anymore. Um, so we've used that sort of as needed, but it's not part of our standard recipe anymore. So I mentioned a, a pan genome. So this is what it looks like for our uh, part of our maize pan genome collection. Um, as you could sort of anticipate, um, the chromosome, uh, the bio nano maps that we get do break often at the centromeres or subtelomeric repeats in a very repeatable way. Um, but um, this simple cartoon is conveying the fact that all the genomes that we've done have now been put into very high quality pseudomolecules. Um, to add to our pan genome collection and then to start to, to, to distribute to researchers. So here's really where the fun begins. So um, next I'm going to talk about some uh, pan genome visualization widgets that I've been working on to sort of get at the question of, okay, what do I do now? Um, we obviously annotate these genomes and deploy them individually as, as JBrowse instances to our, to our researchers, but how do you start to make um, comparisons and that sort of thing? So I guarantee that all of you have seen dot blots at this uh, conference. Um, most of the time that's involving using Mummer um, to compare two genomes or perhaps plotting uh, markers um, for two genomes. But in the pan genome era in the year 2019, I really wanted to come up with a better way to enable um, dot blot visualizations and macro scale comparisons between pan genomes. So um, sort of the approach that I came up with is to take a genome chop it up into bits, find a unique sequence every 1 KB or 5 KB or 10 KB or whatever you want to do, keep track of the order of those chunks, and then align them to all of your other reference genomes. And this is something you do very fast. Um, so basically you're doing all by all comparison of novel chunks. If you're using markers, you'll be blind to new pieces of DNA that are in your reference. So you always want to be sort of de novo in that approach. Um, and then the, the part I really like is if you apply an offset to that, you can see all of your um, reference genomes into one view, um, and the inversions and inserts and deletions um, stand out very quickly. So this is like the, the, the wide-eyed view that everyone wants to get very quickly. Um, again, this works best with platinum-grade assemblies. Um, so as awesome as the public B73 reference was that came out a few years ago, I, I don't put that into here because every little misassembly in that um, will be construed as an SV and just, you know, panic would ensue. So I, I don't put, um, it's very important that you use platinum grade assemblies for this. Um, and what's nice about putting it into something like Spotfire is you can zoom in and out of this um, and fully customize it. Most stop blocks you see are not interactive in any way. So um, although I did hopefully convince you that maze is very diverse at the sequence level, <laughs> Um, interestingly, it's not just um, uh, chaos throughout the genome. Chromosome 1 is chromosome 1, and we see very few um, large-scale um, uh, SV on chromosome 1. Now, on chromosome 2, we did detect some interesting um, inversions that are a third the size of the chromosome. Um, this becomes particularly interesting when I'm talking about elite inbreds that our breeders never knew that this type of thing was going on. Um, this is a case where you might want to add high C just to convince them of that, which we did. Um, 
but um, on a whole, um, Mays um, has very few large um, SVs. And having a, tag, a system like tag dots um, could really enable you to deploy this to, to folks and have them um, interact with their region of interest to see how much SV there is up there. It's very difficult to get this type of view with the bio nano maps at this point, but that's another way you could go about it. Now, the first question you'll get for any interesting SV you, get, you, you see is, is it real? And people have this innate confidence in older assemblies for some reason. They just trust that what we've been using all this time was right um, and what I'm doing now is wrong. So um, if you have this type of view, um, if you see something twice and you did it independently, then you're even more confident. But um, if you see an inversion like this, um, it is very important to be able to trace the, the provenance of it. Um, and just in general, if you could trace your SVs back to a contig, um, so in this case, this um, inversion is contained within a contig, contained within a scaffold, and you can see that's very robust. Um, just in general, if your SV is the same size as a contig or scaffold, then, then you're in trouble because it could mean that you just put it in the wrong way. And there are some things, I've seen palindromic labeling patterns with BioNano where a contig could be put in um, in either direction. So it is important to keep track of how your platinum grades assembly were built from the ground up. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is another approach that I've come up with for, um, again, we're going to need lots of widgets and lots of visualization tools to look at the pan genome uh, for all these species. Um, but just one that sort of fills another space is this, this panda application that I come up with. Um, so it's very appealing to try to align all of your genomes and look at them at once um, in IGV. Um, that could be computationally intensive to do that and have a bunch of caveats. Um, so I came up with a very simple approach of just taking a genome and uh, chunking it up into 10 or 20 or 30 KB size fragments and then aligning those. And that happens using Minimap 2 uh, very quickly. And the neat thing is that these pieces will then sort of just line up again like they were before, um, functionally recreating 1x coverage um, in an IGV. It looks like 1x coverage from the coverage graph. But here's how you can get all of your pan genome information into basically one BAM file. Um, and if you implement it in an IGV, you can zoom in, zoom out, and color things. This is how it looks on the, the gene scale. Basically, all of your haplotypes are here. Um, and you would say, well, I can get that same thing from aligning Illumina data. Um, but in the case of maze, we definitely wouldn't get unique alignments in that intron there. Um, and you'd be talking about 30x coverage. So here I'm talking about aligning genomes. Um, basically having a BAM file has 1x coverage. So this is really powerful. If you sort of let this play out like I described, this looks like that cartoon I was showing before where you have things that are completely shared, semi-shared, um, and fairly unique. Um, in an IGV, you can really play with this in terms of how you, how you display it. Um, so the first thing that I was interested in, the whole reason I, I was going through this approach, um, you know, annotation takes longer. That's more of a bottleneck than anything else. And it's hard to do comparative annotation work when you're not confident that your annotations are 100% accurate. So an easier way to do it is just to look for novel genomic segments and let the annotation folks figure out things later. Um, so with the Panda approach that I've described, it's very easy to identify um, self-alignments that are unique. So in this case, you know, that's 60 KB that's unique only found in, in that one line. Um, this has immediate um, impact. You know, a lot of our uh, members of our pan genome collection are disease resistance line. We sequence them only to get the sequence at a QTL. Um, this type of information is immediately useful. Um, the, the folks that are trying to map this QTL will know they're likely never to uh, find map any further than the border to that unique segment. Um, and the, um, the tags on, on opposite sides are really providing a pool of sequence diversity to use for, for marker development. So the last slide I have um, is just a public service announcement. Um, I always like to do as much good for the community as possible. Um, and those of you that have large contig assemblies that you're very proud of should pay extra uh, close attention. And I'm talking about contigs that are like 20 megabases and larger, as um, the pr previous presentation showed. So, if you're browsing your BioNano hybrid scaffolds, which I highly recommend, you'll see all kinds of interesting things, um, you might see like a hole. And you might say, hey, how come, how come nothing aligned there? Um, you do see cases where there's no labels 
um, or, or scarcity of labels, you won't get that. Um, there's, there's several reasons why you, won't ha you might have small holes in your hybrid scaffolding, but a big hole should definitely not be there. So with much detective work, I was able to trace this back to, um, to an issue with canoe that happens during, during consensus building. So with this issue, I'm not even going to call it a bug because it's not really a problem until we push, unless you're pushing your software to the, to the limits, you're never going to really know what it can do or not do. But there's this issue where, in this case, um, a 7 megabase contig, a 6 megabase contig, and two 4 megabase contigs just dropped out of the assembly at the consensus stage. Um, and you wouldn't really know that until you reach uh, your bio nano scaffolding. So fortunately, this bug has been corrected. So you might have to go back and redo your assemblies, um, which I've done. Um, yeah, so the issue should be resolved, but it's definitely something worth monitoring. As you're going through the process from contigs to pseudomolecules, there's lots of steps where um, contigs could drop out or things could go to rise. So um, you definitely have to build in uh, QC steps along the way. That's why it's very difficult to come up with an end-to-end -end pipeline for this. You definitely have to have processes that are fluid and change with the times um, with lots of QC steps built in. So my last slide, I just want to circle back as to why the heck are we doing all this work? Why are we doing all that? Um, and again, it's to provide actionable sequence information's, information to researchers that's, um, again, highly accurate. Um, another thing I like to do for all my assemblies is to align the chromium data and PEC bio data back to the final assembly so that everyone, if anyone ever comes asking, um, which they always do, they always say, oh, is this C right? Is this G right? Um, my immediate response is yes. I don't even need to look, but it's nice to have these um, on hand to look at. And, and just my final note on accuracy, my, my real response to how accurate are our assemblies now, really it's 100% accurate except for where it's not. Because you could, you could browse these genomes from megabases and megabases and not see any conflicts between the PacBio and, and Chromium data in the assembly. But in some small little contig uh, where some repeat got integrated in some map, there's, there's some error there. Um, but other than that, um, we've really come a long way. Um, and with that, that's, that's what I have. Thank you.